Good morning. If you have a Bible, please open it to Ephesians chapter 4, fourth chapter of Ephesians. You'll find the notes in the bulletin or in that link underneath the um, video or audio that you're listening to right now. And uh, you can follow along in our study. This morning, we are going to move just a little bit further into Ephesians. We're going to cover, in fact, one verse. Um, But there's a, there's a method to my madness, or at least I hope there is, and it is that Paul is moving through in this section a list of put-offs and put-ons, a list of conduct that he wants the church to adopt, conduct he wants the church to cast aside. And in one real sense, and we're finally getting to the practical application, three chapters of doctrinal truth. And even woven into this second half, a ton of doctrinal truth about the nature of the church, about the nature of the body of Christ. And so it's easy to see this list and just look at it as some moralistic checklist. And yet, part of the reason I want to slow down is because I think there's so much here. This is much more than the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments that simply say, don't do this. And as we chew on it, as we think through this, it'll un unpack and it will reveal the heart of what's going on. Um, We looked last week at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and I often, in my own pastoral counseling and in my own Christian life talking to others, Christians get that the Bible tells us what we should do. There's a goal. There's, There's conduct that the Bible calls on us to do. And Christians get that the Bible tells us what not to do and even can condemn, convict, warn us, when we fail, and Paul speaks of those two uses of Scripture in, in 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, all Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for teaching and for reproof or rebuke. And yet often in my own life and the lives of others I know and in, in pastoral counseling, that's as far as many Christians get with Scripture's use. So yes, Scripture says not to do this. Scripture says to do this. But what do you do with the person who, who's gotten that far and is still finding change difficult. That's why we looked for an entire week last week on anger, because I know in myself and other people I know, we know anger is wrong, and when we become angry sinfully, we get convicted, we feel awful, but how do, how do I stop this pattern? How do I stop this pattern of becoming angry, confessing, repenting, becoming angry, confessing, repenting? And Paul says scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, and correction, and training in righteousness. And that's hopefully what we're going to start unpacking some of here. I'd like to begin by reading uh, the larger text um, in its entirety that we're working through slowly, and there's a couple more weeks to go. Uh, Join with me. It really starts all the way back to Pastor Daniel's text, verse 17 of chapter 4 through the end of the chapter. Now this I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander 
be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would um, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. That our study this morning would not be um, just looking at a moral code or a law, but that you would help us to see how by your power and by your word we might actually change and grow. We pray that we would not be hearers only of the word, but doers. That you would sanctify your people. That you would give the increase. That you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. When is a thief no longer a thief? That's the title of my message this morning. And I'm sure, as I've pointed this out in previous weeks, many of you may already know where I'm getting at with this. But it's, it's, it's a significant question to consider. Now, thievery, theft, is not a sin most people are willing to acknowledge. I don't know if I've met many or any self-admitted thieves. People admit to other sins, more respectable sins, but but usually not to this. And so there perhaps are some of you sitting here thinking, great, a message for that person right over there. They needed to hear this. But I hope by our time this morning is done, you'll see this does apply. But the the point of my question and my title is tied up with the biblical concept of change. Change hasn't happened until not only have you put off old behavior, but until you've put on corresponding Christ-like behavior. Change does not happen simply by stopping a bad habit or bad trait. It it involves inward renewal, put off, renew, put on. In fact, that three-way arrow you see at the bottom of the notes is something I'll often draw on a whiteboard. A meeting, talking through each arrow, you'd write around it ideas, strategies for both the putting off of sinful behavior of the renewal of the mind, the vertical, and the putting on of new behavior. And what we learn here is that a thief doesn't stop being a thief simply because they stop stealing. Any more than a liar stops being a liar just because they stop lying. Change hasn't happened until something has happened on the inside, in the heart. A thief is no longer a thief, not when they stop stealing, but when they work hard, when they become generous, when they can give to others. When rather than taking from others' abundance, they have abundance to give to others in need. And so we're going to look through this. It's it's one verse. There's a lot here, and I hope some of the dots will connect for you. The penny will drop, not only just with this issue, but also with others and how biblical change works. So with that, by way of introduction, I would like to dive in. We're going to look at this in two points. Put off, put on. So point number one. Put off, let's take a look at the audience. Who is Paul talking to? And this is an important reminder because, of course, in your blank here, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians. He introduced this entire section of putting off and putting on by saying, in verse 20, that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off the old self. So he's speaking to people that he's making the assumption have heard of have been taught in Christ. This is not instruction for unbelievers. we, we got to be really careful with that because otherwise unbelievers can think, if I just do these things, if I can stop lying, if I can stop getting angry, if I can just stop stealing, then I'll be acceptable to God. And you got the gospel backwards. Um, we, we've been saved. We, we only become acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's why chapter 4 is not chapter 1. Because Paul has already taught but our adoption, our election, our being made alive in Christ, our salvation by faith through his death on the cross, where he set aside the law of commandments and ordinances, where he and his body took our penalty for our sin. That's why all that came first. Because when we finally get to moral instruction, you've got to know how to put it properly. This is the outflow of salvation. This is the the fruit and not the root of our salvation. This is the evidence of faith. This is not the cause of forgiveness. 
So, so if you're here this morning, if you're listening online, this instruction and this message is for those who have already bowed the knee to King Jesus. To those who have already come to realize their sinfulness, their guilt before God, their need of a Savior and a substitute. And we are those who have looked to Christ, to his sinless life, to his death on the cross, on our behalf. We're trusting in him and him alone. And in that faith and in that confidence, we receive the forgiveness of sins. And from that vantage point, as forgiven, adopted, received, born again, renewed, Spirit and dwelt people. Now, we're going to try to stop stealing. That's, that's really important to get. That's really important to get. So who's he speaking to? The audience is Christians. Next, this is not a specific nuanced setting. The blank here is this is general instruction. Well, why do I say that? Because Paul's going to address issues of theft and coveting and work ethic in specific circumstances elsewhere in Ephesians. Just look over to chapter 5. In chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness. Same word, by the way, translated as greed. A few verses earlier in our passage, verse 19, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So we're talking about similar things. Here it's in the context of sexual immorality and the coveting and the theft of a sense that can take place there. In chapter 6, he's going to speak to to working hard and heartily for God, to servants and slaves. Look at verse 5 of chapter 6. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or he is free. So he's going to deal specifically with work ethic, There, he's dealing with covetousness and greed in relation to to sexual sin. So this I'm taking as a general and broad instruction. He's not speaking to one particular section. And so consequently, as we study through this, we're going to slow down and think of the different ways theft, stealing, can manifest itself. I think this is probably a, a more troublesome sin for us than we might first think. So Paul Because he's not narrowing it down. He's speaking generally. This is instruction not just for the poor, but for the rich. For the slave and for the free. For men and for women. For children and old men and old women. That's my assumption. He's giving it generally. Okay? So the audience, Christians. People who've been taught Christ. The instruction is general. This isn't some niche instruction. This is a broadband instruction. Then let's get after the audience now, to the command itself. And the, my division here is between fruit and root. And what I have in mind here is the difference between, difference between the external deeds, the words that come out of the mouth, the actions that occur in space and time, and the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Biblically, Jesus says, whatever comes out of the mouth comes out of the heart. Biblically, your, your deeds and your words start as thoughts, attitudes of your heart. The heart is the wellspring of life, Proverbs warns us. And so we're going to look at the actual fruit that he's forbidding, theft. And then, working backwards with what he says, we're going to see that Paul's shedding light on some of the motivations, some of the issues in the heart that would lead to this. So I'm separating both in the put off and the put on, putting off wrong behavior and putting off wrong attitudes, beliefs, and thoughts of the heart. That's what I mean by fruit and root both in the put-off and in the put-on. So let's take a look at the fruit, the deeds and the actions. It's really straightforward. Let the thief no longer steal. This is no new command, of course. This actually is found quite simply in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 15. You shall not steal. Nor is this a command unique to Christianity. Virtually all cultures agree on this principle. We may disagree on how we divide things up and who's Possessions belong to whom, but in virtually every culture, once those divisions have been made, it's frowned upon socially to cross those lines and take what is not yours. 
So there's nothing fundamentally new about this command, both within the church and culturally. But the fact that he needs to say it at all tells us something about what's going on. In fact, the fact that Paul has to tell Christians not to steal has led some commentators to think this has got to be a mistake. He must be speaking with their old manner of life. It doesn't work. Uh, the, the participle here, the thief, let him who the thief no longer steal, is the one stealing. And in the context of putting off the old man, putting on the new man, apparently some traits, some old ways of living and walking remained in the body. Well, in one sense, that's comforting, right? If Paul has to tell a mature, growing church in Ephesus, hey, guys, stop stealing. Then there's some encouragement that, hey, these sins we may struggle with, they're struggling with. It also means then there's no excuse. Because your, your blank here, your next blank is, and I want to slow down, is there are many ways to steal. I, I've, I've identified at least six biblically, and I could probably come up with another three or four subsets of, of theft. And because this instruction is broadband to the body, I think it's worth considering because you may... Only when you think of theft, think of my first instance here. And the first and most obvious type of theft is the, is the hoodlum, the thug, the mugger, the robber. The one who Proverbs chapter 1 speaks about. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole. Like those who go down to the pit, we shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our house with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will have one purse, my son. Do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Now, certainly, that is a type of theft. This might be more the professional thief, the professional thug. And and it's possible that's still going on in the church. I think this is probably the least likely type of theft going on in the church. And yet, for many of us, when we think of a thief, this is what we think of. Or maybe somebody wearing a mask... Sneaking in at night, you know, with the pink panther on his case. I, I don't think that's what Paul primarily has in view. Certainly that is wrong. That's a biblical category. I'm assuming this is not a besetting sin for many of us here. I hope so. Um, that we're not going out in the street and mugging people or breaking into homes at night and committing heists. That's, that's certainly a theft. That's wrong. And if you're doing it, stop it. But let's move on now to other types of theft. Probably more in view is the theft that comes from desperate need and hunger and poverty. The social nets that are in place for us were not in place for the first century Christians. We know the Christians as a group were despised. So if there was little going around, it would make sense the church would have even less. If the rains didn't come, if the crops didn't grow, if the ship sunk at sea... All your plans could be scattered. And the Bible speaks of this, referencing this, Proverbs 6, 30 to 31. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. Or the author of Proverbs 30 offers up this prayer to God. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches, Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Contrary to much situational ethics, the Bible recognizes that stealing from desperation, stealing from hunger and starvation, is of a different sort and of a different guilt than the thugger, thugger? The thug and the mugger. Sorry, Mom. It's of a different sort, but notice it's still not excused. The author of Proverbs 30 asks the Lord to keep that type of poverty from him, lest he steal and profane the name of God. Theft, even when you're starving, is wrong. That goes against a lot of cultural moralists and moralism today. It's, it's, it's more understandable. People don't despise a thief when they steal to satisfy their hunger. But afterwards, according to Proverbs 6, 31, he will repay sevenfold. That's a different type of theft. That may be more of what's in view. 
You're desperate. You're hungry. Your kids are hungry. You need to do something. You steal. You grab a loaf of bread. You grab some meat. You, you see you, you, however you come across your ill-gotten gains. A third type of theft. Theft from cheating. Guile. Craftiness. This is the type of theft where the person you steal from may not even know that they've been robbed. Leviticus 19, oh, sorry, um, Proverbs 20, verse 23. Unequal weights are an abomination to the Lord, and false scales are not good. See, if you're a merchant, and this is where dealing with theft can go beyond being poor. Here we've got a merchant. We've got somebody who sells, a store owner. And unequal weights is a way of robbing your customer. You've got weights that, let's use our nomenclature, you've got a, a one-pound weight, and you've got a full one-pound weight, and you've got one that's a little light. Instead of 16 ounces, it's 14 and a half ounces. And depending on how savvy you estimate your customer, you use the full one-pound weight. Or if you think the person might be a bit of a rube, a little naive, you bust out the 14 and a half ounce one. You tell them you're selling them one pound of goods, and you're robbing them. And it's an abomination to God. Now, of this sort, it might be uh, for those of you who bill hourly, overbilling. Just a little bit. I think that falls into false weights. I think this would include things like cheating academically. That's a form of theft. Or um, working and being idle on the clock. Uh, the, the gentleman who's done some work around my house said he got his first job in carpentry when the, four, um, the foreman discovered his entire work crew asleep on a roof, taking a nap while on the clock. That's theft. You're stealing. Because you're going to expect to get paid for work you haven't done. You are stealing from your employer. And again, stealing from the man, stealing from big business today is much more morally acceptable. Biblically, it's still theft and it's wrong. So stealing can happen from the poor, those on the bottom. Stealing can happen through greed and avarice. You can simply steal by lying on your income taxes forms. Right? You can steal that way. You can do half-hearted work, not heartily as unto the Lord. You can take extra breaks. These, these are all ways to steal. Or, number fourth. Theft from unpaid bills and obligations. Leviticus 19.13. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. James 5.4. Behold, the wages of the laborer who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Owing money. And not paying it. Owing bills that you don't intend to pay. Some consumer debt could fall into this. If you're an employer and you're you're being slow to pay your employees, Leviticus 19.13 says you're robbing him. This would include borrowing things from friends that you don't give back. Or you give back in substandard condition. These are all forms of theft. Number five, through unjust laws, rules, decrees, and other oppression. Listen to Isaiah 10, 1 through 2. Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees, and the writers who keep writing oppression, to turn aside the needy from justice, and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil, that they may take the fatherless and make them their prey. Or Proverbs 22, 22 to 23. Do not rob the poor because he is poor. Or crush the afflicted at the gate. The Lord will plead their cause and rob of life those who rob them. So employers can rob the poor through, through unjust rules. I know plenty of people who were very clear in their job interviews, negotiating, saying, look, I, I won't be called into work on Sundays, will I? The employer says, no, I won't call you on a Sundays, or you'll only have to work one Sunday a month, and very quickly, yeah, I guess what, we need to do something different. You're breaking your word, you're a liar and a thief. You're robbing them of what is theirs. Governments can do this with unjust laws. 
I, I view in one sense every time we print more money, all we're doing is taxing people's savings because your money is worth less. Um, I won't go far down that road. But there are many ways to steal. And finally, the, the sixth one I came up with is this. You can steal from God. Listen to Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In the tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse if you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I want to open the windows of heaven for you and pour down from you a blessing until there is no more need. So there are six distinct categories of theft, and I think I could make more subdivisions, but I'll just remind you. We got the, the, the thug, the mugger, the brigand, the rogue who meets people in the street and, and robs them. We've got those who steal from desperate need and hunger and poverty. We've got the theft that comes from conniving, greed, dishonesty, cheating, We have theft from unpaid bills and obligations, theft from unrighteous laws, rules, decrees, and management. And we can steal from God. And, and our hearts are master propagandists. And our hearts have no inability to come up with a myriad of justifications for why it's okay. They don't need it, they have so much, they won't miss it anyway. Well, my need is so great, you'd understand. Or, I don't like what the government's doing with my money anyway, so I feel an obligation to give them less. Whatever clever justification you have, you're sinning against God. Disobeying His word. You're bringing reproach upon His name. And the Bible calls it theft, stealing. You are, I am, Whatever degree I'm doing this, a thief. And so maybe now you see this net's a little bigger than we might have thought coming in this morning. It's catching a few more of us. Okay. So that's the fruit. Let the thief no longer steal. And the Bible can speak of a number of things as theft. What's at its root? Now, Paul doesn't identify it negatively, but he does positively. And so if we reverse engineer backwards, we, we get some insight. The first, at the root of this type of theft, and why I don't think the career criminal, the villain from some Pink Panther movie is in view here, is because this is the theft that's connected to laziness and sloth. Your first blank, you can write either one of those. Why do I say that? Well, because this thief needs to learn to work hard, which indicates he's not working hard now. This is where slowing down and thinking through this can be helpful. We, we realize that one of the heart motivations that can lead to this type of behavior is laziness. You know, my, my, my boss isn't checking up on me, so I'll work a little more casually. I'll take longer breaks. Billable hours. You know, well, you know, I was thinking about it a little bit on the car ride, so I guess I can bill that. And so... Laziness and sloth feed into this. A lack of desire for hard work. You still want good things. You just don't want to do the hard work to get the good things. And the Proverbs warn of this. L listen to some of these passages about sloth. Um, Proverbs 6, 6 through 9. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer, gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest. And your poverty will come upon you like an armed man. Proverbs 24, 30 through 34. I passed by the field of the sluggard, by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles and a stone wall has broken down. Then I saw and considered. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. And it's not hard to see how when that want and that poverty comes upon you and you're desperate, rather than taking your lumps and saying, well, during the sowing season, I did not sow. I rested and I slept. I played Xbox, whatever. 
I guess now I go hungry. You're unwilling to receive those consequences, and so you steal. Um, Paul speaks about this in 2 Thessalonians 3, the idleness. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness, not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you ourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any one of you. I might put as another category, a seventh category of theft, would be the theft that comes from looking for and asking for handouts and help when the reason you're in need is simply laziness. For Paul says, for even when we were with you, we'd give this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. It is not a kindness to give food to the idle. It doesn't help them. For we hear that some among you walk in the idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. And as such persons, we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. So sloth and laziness... Is, is a motivating factor for this type of theft. You goof off at work, and rather than telling your employer, hey, I know I was on the clock for four hours today, but really you should only pay me for three and a half hours because I was checking Facebook for half an hour there. You take the paycheck. How's he going to know? You're a thief. Second motivating force in the heart Self-centeredness or selfishness. I wasn't sure which one to go with. You can put either one of those in there for C2. A focus on yourself. This is the corollary. The reason why you're unwilling to receive the results, the fruit of your sloth, is because you think an awfully great deal about yourself. Um, You don't want to go hungry. You don't want to go without. You don't want to wait for the new thing that just came out. You want it now. And so you put those two things together, a lack of industry, a lack of work ethic, and yet a focus on self, and you end up with someone who's dishonest, someone who's a swindler, someone who steals. Where do I get that from? Again, the corresponding put on. Be generous. Thinking of others in need. What does that tell you about this person? They're not thinking of others. They're not looking for others with need. They're not concerned about what others need. They're concerned about what they need, what they want. And so we can sort of reverse engineer what's going on in the heart. Not all theft comes from this, but I think much of it does. A lack of industry, a lack of work ethic, and an over-focus on oneself and what one's own needs are and what one's own problems and what I want. That's what's going on in the heart. The root of the matter And we could probably even add a third one close to that, covetousness, just because Paul's just said it in close proximity. If you go back to verse 19, describing what we're not to live like anymore, the way the Gentiles used to live, they've become callous, they've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy or covetous to practice every kind of impurity. And so that's that's where this type of swindly, dishonest, stealing thievery can come from. And again, if you look at your own hearts, these are things that are in our hearts, right? A propensity to rest and sloth and laziness. Well, I think these are besetting sins. Certainly that's something I can struggle with. A focus on myself, what I need, not what others need. Not what others lack or require. Oh, yeah. And when you see that, that, that also means when you're trying to fight this sin, you're not just, stop, i got to stop stealing. But you're trying to attack also, pray against also, the self-centeredness, the laziness that, that can be in the heart. Which Let's get to our put on now. Let's get to our put on. The fruit. Two things. He says, but rather, instead, let him labor doing honest work with his own hands. As we have hard work. Hard work. Paul picks a word intentionally that carries the idea of toil. Labor. There are basic words that just mean work. This emphasizes the laborious nature of it. Hard work. If you struggle with this type of honesty, you want to find not just work, but hard work to do. And again, maybe your job is one where you sit and type in a computer. Part of coming up with a strategy 
for putting off and putting on, would then involve, okay, I've got to find some hard work to do. I, I do most of my work with my mind, reading, thinking, writing, and I feel great after I've done some physical labor. I spent a couple hours yesterday working on my lawn. I went to bed tired and felt great. Um, Ecclesiastes gives this instruction. Ecclesiastes 5.12. Sweet is the sleep of the laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. See, God made us for work. You are not made to be idle. Rest is a part of life, and we're made to have periods and times of rest, but to sort of live in a perpetual idleness. This is one of the reasons why this this lockdown has been so difficult for so many, because so many who were being productive are being forced um, to, to abandon the productive work they were doing, and many have slipped into idleness. That's not good for people. They're not going to feel good. They're not going to sleep well. So hard work, physical labor, if possible. And not just hard work, but useful work. Doing something productive. Doing something worthwhile. Doing honest work. It's translated as honest work, but good work. And again, that can be difficult because in our day and age, some of the work people are called to do is utterly worthless. You can get paid for it, but it's hard to see any value in what you're doing. And so Paul is urging such a person as you or I struggling with this to work hard and to work at something useful. Because this is connected to finally having something useful to give someone in need. That's where this is moving towards. Work hard. Work with your hands. Do work that's useful or good. This is similar to, if you turn over to Ephesians 6, what he tells the slaves for their masters, right? Bond servants, verse 5, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with good will to the Lord, not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or free. That'll work hard, that'll work well, doing good work. So you've got to put that on, which then means at the heart level, that leads to the issues of the heart that need to take the place. Taking the place of laziness and selfishness is generosity. It's generosity. And this really is the flip and the change of the dynamic. You're really... You've got somebody who, rather than being generous, is taking. They view themselves as in need. They view themselves as entitled. I deserve this. They don't deserve this. They won't miss it. I need this. And now they are actually the one giving to someone who's in need. Their eyes are off themselves. They're looking to others. This is generosity. Because, of course, there are some who are poor, not due to laziness and sloth, but due to no wrong of their own doing. There are those who are poor through no fault of their own, those who are in need legitimately, genuinely. We are to help them. Let me me read a quote here from uh, Jim Boyce on this. Here, the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian outlook is most evident. For Paul does not say, as many secular thinkers might, work hard because that will build self-esteem. Or because you'll be able to buy the things you want and enjoy the good life. He says rather... Because you will then have something to share with those in need. So why we do what we do matters, doesn't it? You could stop stealing for wrong reasons. You could stop being lazy simply because you want that new car. And here Paul is saying, stop being lazy. Stop being self-centered so that you can help others. That's when change happens. When's a thief no longer a thief? When he's actually got a work ethic and able to give to others. That's when change has happened. Generosity. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. And he'll repay him for his deed. This may also emphasize why Paul has highlighted God's generosity to the Christians in the first chapter. He's given us every spiritual blessing. He's given us a rich inheritance. He's given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of that inheritance until we possess it. 
And so we then can become generous in response to God's generosity to us. Again, you start with the gospel, you start with salvation, and then you flow out. Hey, Paul says, let me tell you how generous our rich God and Father has been to us, how he's given you everything lavishly, an inheritance, his spirit, he's adopted you. Now, you can, in some small degree, go be like him. You you can pass that on. You can be like Christ to others as you become generous. That's how the gospel works into this. This isn't simply a moral code. This is something that flows out of the gospel. And also compassion. Compassion. Because you've got to be not only having excess to give, but you've got to have an eye for those who need it. You've got to have an eye for those who need it. This can even link back in with Paul's bigger theme of church unity. Because you're focused not just on yourself, but on those around you, those in the body. Listen to Paul's instructions in Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You're you're working hard, and you're working hard not for more stuff for yourself, but you might give, and you're looking, and your eyes looking for those in need, for those you can bless. that's, That's what you need to become. I want to take a few minutes and just try to put this together practically before we move to our closing song and time of communion. Practically, if if you struggle with this, what what might a strategy or a plan for change look like? Well, you'd want to be thinking along all three of these axes, the putting off, the renewing, and the putting on. Frequently, we just focus on the put off. And so if I were dealing with someone, if I were counseling someone, or if I were dealing with myself with someone who is... um, Let's pick one of these. Someone who is dishonestly stealing, underreporting on his income tax, overbilling, um, taking large chunks of time off while on the clock. How, how might a strategy for change look like? Well, you'd want to think along the putting off. And here you'd want guardrails in place, consequences in place for that wrong behavior. The first and hardest one would be go confess to the one from whom you've stole. You know, write your letter to the IRS. Go set up a meeting with your boss, your client that you've overbilled. Because restitution is a necessary part and fruit of repentance. Go read 2 Corinthians 7, 10, and 11. What avenging of wrong there is. What repayment. If you're not prepared to repay what you've done, if you're just going to say, okay, I won't do it anymore moving forward, you're not repentant. You're still a thief. Go, go commit to confess. and say, That'll put some teeth in it. Next time you're tempted to be idle on the work, next time you're tempted to overbill, next time you're pe- tempted to lie in your income tax form, just think to yourself, I've committed before God that where I see this, I'm going to rectify it. I don't want to write a letter to the IRS. Just put some teeth into this thing. Commit that you're going to make restitution when it happens. Set up some accountability. Maybe you've got a friend or your wife, or your husband, that you're going to have asked you periodically, how have you been doing? I'll stick with just one, the, the, the one who's loafing around on the job. Um, I used to have a job back as an unbeliever where my friend and I would work together at, at a hotel, and we'd take times taking naps covering for the other person. So I'd go in a room as a, it was a big business center, and we were setting up rooms. And I think our justification was, well, as long as we get the work we need done, done, it's okay. So we'd set up the room really quickly, and then I'd take a nap for an hour, and he'd sort of, you know, just sort of do stuff, keeping in. If someone came, he'd come again, and we'd do back and forth. We're, we're stealing. So you could have someone hold you accountable. You could memorize passages that speak about the evil of theft. Okay, the renew category. Make sure you're doing basic spiritual disciplines. Are you in fellowship? Are you gathering for worship? Or, or given our current climate, are you at least you know, making time to sit down with you or in a household, listen to the message, and, and, and worship as you're able? Are you in God's word? So often, as people I'm talking to are struggling with sins, I'm not surprised, but so often... Not only are they struggling with a particular issue they're struggling with, but their prayer life, their Bible reading life is dried up. And, and Paul makes it clear this type of change happens in a context where we're being renewed. We're being renewed. It also would mean focusing on 
all manifestations of laziness, not just at work. Focusing on all manifestations of selfishness, not just in relationship to... Because you want to pull the entire weed up by the roots, don't you? And so you're, you're praying and focusing not just on the fruit of the selfishness and laziness, but the root, the selfishness and laziness itself. You're praying, Lord, help me to work hard and develop a good work ethic. Lord, give me a heart of compassion for the poor and the needy. And positively, you're, you're planning your time so that you won't become idle. You're making your schedule. You're not just saying, I'll figure out what I'm going to do tomorrow, tomorrow. You're going to figure out what you're going to do tomorrow, today. Isn't it amazing that in Genesis 1, Moses tells us how God created the heavens and the earth, and God didn't just create the heavens and the earth. He determined, let us, and then he did it. So God plans before he acts. You should too. I should too. It is godly to plan. And then, of course, you've got some measure of accountability because your wife or your husband or your friend can say how much of the things you did that you planned to do, did you in fact do? When I was going through seminary, my wife would do this. She, she was working as a school teacher, and so I was at home preparing for classes. Sometimes I wouldn't have a class till 11 in the morning, so I'm reading and working. And I found it very easy for myself to get off task and, and waste time. And so what would happen is when we get up in the morning and drive her to school, I'd tell her, these are the things I'm purposing to do today. And I'd like you to ask me at lunchtime how much of that I got done. But those are the types of things you can do if you're serious about changing. But it's holistic. You're dealing with sloth and laziness in every area. You're dealing with selfishness and self centeredness in every area. You're not just focusing on this one thing, but the issues in the heart that it exposes. And then you're tweaking that plan. That's how change happens, biblically, for Christians. You're putting off, you're being renewed, and you're putting on. And guess what? God gives grace, and his spirit changes our hearts. And I've seen people become different, truly changed. Not simply behavior modification, but inward change. The Lord would have his people be holy as he is holy. And so in this one little verse, I think it's a net that catches many of us. We see the put off, the put on, and the renewal. And the good news is we can change. We're not left just as we are. The gospel saves us and the gospel transforms us. So we're going to close in prayer now. The worship team's going to come up. And we're going to transition to a time of communion. Let's just have a word of prayer. Lord God, how good you are. Not simply to save us and redeem us, but you've given us your word, you've given us your spirit, you've given us your people that we might not remain as we are. You have fashioned us in Christ for good works which you prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord, help us now not to achieve your forgiveness and mercy, but because we have already received it, to walk in that newness of life, to put off the old man, to no longer live as we once did, Help us to put on the new man, transform us, renew our minds, make us more like Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.